and all the big calls on all the big races. Welcome back to another feature weekend. What a shout brought to you by the Racing Post. Filmed somewhere in the capital on a Friday morning. Dave Orton, thrilled to be back with you on what is another belting weekend, let's face it. Cheltenham Trials Day joins us. We've got a great card up at Doncaster as well. The Irish action out there as well. Who could we have for you on the panel? If you're watching on YouTube, like and subscribe. Anything on Facebook, do let the panellists know your feedback. They'd love to read that as we go on. And of course, if you're on Twitter, hashtag what a shout. Brought to you by our sponsors, Bet365. Delighted to say, senior reporter Chris Cook joins us back. Chris, welcome. Hey Dave, thanks for having me in. Great to have you. It's been a little while since we had you on this show. Yeah. Busy man since then, of course. Well, I've been in the high court for my sins and, you know, reporting on some of these good news stories for horse racing. It's always good news with me, unfortunately, when you, I get dragged you, in it. Well, you're the it you are are man for that, Chris. Yeah. yeah, and of course, there has been a lot going on, so we'll, perhaps we'll get to that a little bit later on in the show. Mm. But this is now a great time for jump racing, yeah. isn't it? Unseasonably dry, of course, but Cheltenham Trials Day wasn't on last year. No, it's, uh, I mean, whenever there's Cheltenham uh, racing, you know, that always gives you a little lift, doesn't it? And so this is the last day before the, the big four days in the middle of March. So um, some interesting racing to try and get, find some winners, but it's always in the back of your mind. You know, you're looking for horses, whether they're winners or whether they're a little bit further down the field. You're just <laughs> looking for that bit of promise that you can say, oh, right, this is going to be one horse I want to be on come the middle of March. Yeah, entries are all out there, aren't they, of course. And along with us, of course, for the ride, Pat Cooney from our sponsors, Bet365. How goes it, Pat? Yes, all very good, thanks. Looking forward to another uh, good weekends of racing. Happy days. Cheltenham Festival now less than 50 days away, Pat. The entries are all out. Feverish times or still a little quiet? No, it's uh, going to get busier and busier. I can give you an exclusive breaking news from midday on Friday. Bet365 will be non run and no bet on every race at the Ooh. Cheltenham Festival. Oh, get those handicap, handicap good things coming out. I love that. Well, hopefully, Pat, it doesn't mean you're going to be cutting the odds about any of them, you know, just because you're going on running a bet, right? Uh, only in moderation. <laughs> Unless C. Cook comes up, of course, on the docket. All right, great to have Pat with us along for the ride as well. So we've scoured the racing world, and I'm delighted to say, this has been a long time coming, this, but... Uh, thrilled to say that uh, Grade 1 winning trainer, dual Grade 1 winning trainer, I should say, from Downton Hall's Shropshire trainer, Henry Daly joins us on the show. Henry, welcome along. Morning, Dave. Good to see you. Great to see you, Henry. And uh, I'll, I'll get this out of the way. I've said this before already this morning. But um, we have fanboys on this show. It happens with Chris, it happens with Kiels, it happens with Pat, and whoever joins us. Henry's one of mine. Because there's a horse that's not going to come up on the graphics by uh, RPR, but since 1998... Uh, Henry took over from the great Captain Forster, of course, to Downton Hall, and there was a horse that sprung him to prominence. It was Edmund, the 1999 Welsh National winner. And just very quickly, I didn't do this with the first take we did this. I was working in a betting shop in Slough. I won't na name the, the brand. I was saving up to go travelling. And that's when I started watching racing after racing after racing. And I always remember, it's an unforgettable name, of course, but Edmund was my... My hero horse. Have you got a horse like that, Chris, that you can remember? Without giving names uh, or well, Young Hustler was a big one for me. And, um, you know, Floyd. I, I was a sucker for front-running chestnuts for some reason. Mr. Frisk used to like him. Um, I was a big fan of, um, you know, Henry's uh, mentor, Tim Forster. Um, and, and, you know, he had those horses that some people would regard as maybe slow. Um, <laughs> I, I sort of tend to take view that slow in the context of steeplechasers is more or less a compliment because those are the horses that keep on grinding forever. Um, I, I don't know if Henry would remember horses like Last Suspect and, and so on. You know, I was, I was just coming into racing when, when he won the Grand National. Um, uh, and yeah, great, great days, great character horses um, that I associate with, with these trainers. It's fair to say, Henry, you had a running start, didn't you, of course? Uh, three winners at the Cheltenham Festival. They all came fairly earlier in your career. But Edmund, he's top of my list. Well, wonderfully <laughs> Uh, exactly. Why would I like him? I don't know. But it's fair to say, um, obviously, the grade one winners. Let's get the graphic up on the screen then of your top chases and your hurdlers by RPR. Trip down memory lane for all our viewers. I'm sure they'd be absolutely loving this. Berejan at the top. Something of a freak was he, Henry? Well, he was bred to win the Derby, so he was not bred to be a straight mile chase or hurdler. And yet he won a Tolworth and the rest is history, isn't it? Of course, a mighty man who very... Uh, I said to you off-air, didn't I? If you go on Henry's website, excellent website, by the way, Henry, and, um, it, it, it really is fun to, uh, to negate 
it, uh, your way around it, but they're all big stamps of horses. We'll get to perhaps the biggest horse in training, but Mighty Man was like Mighty Mouse, wasn't it? Uh, well, your memory can play tricks on you, but certainly that's how I remember him being. He was, there was not much of him, but again, he, he just kept finding there was a big engine in there somewhere. Um, I remember Barajan being kind of bulky, considering, you know, you look at the pedigree and you think, as Henry says, you know, he's, he's bred for the flat. And I, you know, I used to imagine what the Aga Khan was thinking when he saw that fall. You know, was he going, oh, this one's taking me back to Epsom? Or, or did he want, have one look at it and think, ah, oh, this has got Roland Merrick written all over <laughs> it? Yeah. Let's get some big race previews for you then. Off the cuff, it's the 155 at Cheltenham. Grade 3, two mile four handicap. Some very well known names here. Magic Saint, you'll see towards the top of the betting at four to one. Faraday, when it's Saturday, Venetia, of course, uh, she always seems to have one at the top. He came back to form last time. Galahad Quest in there. And Henry, let's come to you. He's back. What more? Surely he's going to get a big one, isn't he, if he keeps sound this season? Well, yeah, I mean, you would. I sure hope so. I don't think well, two and a half miles on good ground is ideal, but I'm very keen to get on a running gym now. It suits, and he's just got to a stage. He's been doing a lot of work. And he's just very, very keen at the moment. I just need to give him a run to get gas out of it, and this seems the most sensible option for him at the moment. I'll tell you what, Paul Keeley will be honing in on Henry's comments there because he's put him up in the weekend or at the start. Of course, our top tipster. Yeah. Uh, he's a massive fan of the horse. I'm a fan of the horse as well. It's like he's been learning his trade. Can he do a young Spartacus and pull it off after this time away? Um, well, just t listening to Henry there, he doesn't sound as though he's absolutely begging us to back the horse. And so I, I think, you know, I'm going to be happy if Fortmore wins, um, but I'm probably going to put my money elsewhere. Yeah, now this is what people don't know about you. If you haven't seen Chris before on the uh, on the show, you are known as senior reporter, racing writer, you all that sort of stuff. But you're also a rather good judge, Chris. Oh, well, and you do of... enjoy this part of the game, don't you? Ah, uh, yeah, no, I absolutely love, um, it, particularly your, your, your handicap chases. You know, um, trying to unscramble those. They're little sort of echoing crossword puzzles, and um, you know, you don't have to get the winner every time to sort of keep yourself interested. Do you? um, hopefully there are potential winners in there at 16 to 1, 20 to 1. Yeah. You know, those are the ones I like having a look at. Which is catching your attention here? Uh, well, uh, Jack Amar, I thought in the end, I mean, is, yeah, I can't pretend that he's double figure odds. I think he's sort of 8, 9 to 1 and he seems to be uh, attracting a bit of betting attention. Uh, you know, even by the time this goes out, he might be shorter. Um, from the Milton Harris stable, it's just having a sort of super sore away season. Um, and you know he's he's one of those he's um, a tough horse reliable. He's run a few times. Always seems to run his run his race, um, and then finally got his head in front last time at Kempton with a, a, quite a strong staying performance. Yeah, he looked beat. He often yeah. looks beat, doesn't he? Well, I mean, you, you wouldn't even be looking at him. I think even on the run to the second last, <laughs> yeah. you know, by plugging on gamely under Paddy yeah. Brennan, and then sort of running on. Um, uh, it wasn't Paddy Brennan at all, was it? He, Paddy's ridden him in the past, um, and again this weekend it was Danny Mullins, wasn't it that day? A bit, of course. Um, Big day for Danny, of course. Um, uh, and yeah, just I, I think that he'll finish. You can absolutely see him sort of tearing up there. Good ground is is fine for him, um, and I think he's on, one of only a couple of last time out winners in the field. I, the, those odds are not bad for a horse with his profile, I, and he's only gone up, I think, four pounds for that win. Yeah, I, I, I wonder whether Magic Saint might click into place here, but I can't be with him. Galahad Quest is one who's disappointed me a little bit, but this is easier than what he's been doing so far. I was on him the last day. I was so disappointed by yeah. that. I wonder whether coming back from the fall at Aintree, if they hadn't gone to Aintree, I think we would have seen maybe a slight... I think they'll probably be regretting that, the William Steve. Go back to his first run of the season there. He looks ready to win a Cheltenham handicap. So uh, he's still young. He's the one for me in a slightly tricky race. Let's see what okay. Henry thinks. If Watmore comes to the last and has a blow, what do you think will be upsides him, Henry? Have you had a look? <laughs> I hope he. I hope he doesn't. Um, I, I just. I, I have no hope. Not the one to, to agree with Chris, but I do think that he's probably only going up four pounds. Quite an assistance to him after Kempton, and I think that probably gives him a great shout. He's he's probably still quite well handicapped. All right then. All of a sudden, your fingers on the buzzers for Jackamar in the one fifty five. 2.30 at Cheltenham, the Cotswold Chase, finally back at Cheltenham, of course. You remember that wonderful race of Native River, sort of Bristol de Maya, of course, at Sandown last year. It turned out to be a pivotal piece of form. Will it be this time around? Let's go to Pat Cooney for a market update. Yeah, well, as things stand at the moment, Chantry House is odds on about four to five at the moment. Uh, market rivals simply the bets, 100 to 30, and the, the very consistent IRI at four. And Santini, the slow Santini at nine, and Corto, Rico, not star, at 66. So depends how you want to play Chantry House, doesn't he? Very disappointing at Boxing Day. 
has first time cheap pieces. I think on balance, he's just the better horse than anything else in the race. So uh, would you want to back five to four on about a horse that pulled up last time out? Probably not. But you look at simply the bets. Will he stay? Will he not stay? I write's the consistent horse. So a tricky, tricky race, this one. I can't help but feel, you know, there's got to be better odds on chances on the uh, on the card at anywhere tomorrow. All right, Pat, thank you for that. Let's bring you in then, Chris. Some interesting points. We've got Santini in there as well. Polly Gundry's the now stable star. The slow Santini, Pat says. <laughs> is, that, is that official now? We have to call him the slow Santini. Well, I, think, I think he's always had a bit of a Don Slowly's about him, hasn't he? I think, yeah. <laughs> but, of course, he was. A cr interestingly, I wonder if Chantry House... Who, of course, Santini won this race for Nicky when in his care. I wonder if Chantry House is in danger of becoming a Santini. Oh, my goodness me. I think you might have gone a bit too far off the back well, of one uh, disappointment no, okay, there. Let's see why. <laughs> I, know, but I can imagine what the viewers <laughs> might think about that. The reason being, Chris, is because this chap, as a novice chaser, ran twice in Grade 1 Company. Okay. He won them both. Yep. He won, of course, the Marsh, and then he went to entry as well. But he did have luck on his side in both. Yeah, it did work out well for him, but I think, you know, objectively, just even taking his performance in isolation, you know, in ratings and times, I, I don't think there was any uh, great deficiency there. Those were sort of worthy winning performances. Um, and he just looks like a horse who's sort of, uh, who's always been promising and is now building into the talent that, that they hoped um, at the most he would prove to be. I like the fact that he improved through the season and, and was peaking at the spring festivals, you know, because you so often you get these horses that promise much in the early part of the season and it just it goes away. Um, come, come the middle of March, and I'm, I'm kind of hoping to see that again from him this time. I find it interesting that Nicky's running him at all, mm. um, because, you know, with a horse, you know, a King George type of horse... Lack of options? It would be quite normal to go straight from Christmas to the middle of March. Uh, and, you know, for, for Nicky, this is not a race he's got circled in his calendar. But he's, with a he's, P he's, next to his name, Chris, you've got to, well, you want to get him back on track, don't you? Do you? Or, or do you... I mean, if you're Nicky, do you maybe take the time to make sure that he's right? I, the fact that he's running at all... That gives me, you know, a, a little bit more confidence and, and hope. I, th I think. Yeah. Um, it, cheap pieces first time is is interesting, but I mean, it's, this is just going to be such a different race from the Kempton race. Isn't I it? think the ground will be in his favour. If it, it uh, simply the bets is an interesting horse, isn't he, for Nichols? Because he hasn't. This is a festival winner, of course. You remember yeah. when he was trained by lots um, of good Cheltenham form. Whittington, of course, he has got us good Cheltenham. But he's been a bit too buzzy so far, hasn't he? A bit too keen. But if Nichols can pull this off. He has got an interesting horse on his hands. And historically, simply the bets, if you go through Kevin Morley tomorrow in your papers in your members club at 6pm on a Friday, look at his 10-year trend section. Simply the bets is the only one left if you apply every single rule. But is he really up to this calibre? The money that came for Chantry House in the King George. And the reason why, again, I say Santini is because he won that intermediate chase, albeit a match that Santini yeah, came yeah, back in. Right. He's following the same sort of route. Yeah, uh, so look, he has to get shrug off that disappointment. But I think it's very forgivable. Um, he, you know, Nicky has said he, he wondered in advance if the King George was just not going to suit this horse, if Kempton wasn't going to suit him, if that strong early pace was just going to make him sulk. And he, he took a bit of a bump, didn't he, at an early stage. And, uh, and you see him shortening into the next two or three fences. Yeah, and I he, right. He's, he's just decided he didn't like it that day, Chantry. Can we have a mention of I right? Yeah, uh, why not indeed? Um, you know, a good Scottish trained horse. Um, you know, game as the day is long, not a very high win rate. He's short um, in the betting, isn't he? I thought that. You know, I mean, I'd give a horse like him a chance if you were getting decent prices. Does that sum up the division a little bit? I think it's more because uh, people look at Chantry House and they go, odds on after a disappointment, what's the point? So they're looking to take him on. And I think that's why you're seeing blue on so many of the other, the other horses in this yeah. race. There's money for simply the bets. You know, people are going, oh, Paul Nichols, he's the man. He'll, he'll beat up Nicky Henderson. Um, or, you know, maybe give I right a chance. He's always running these good races. Um, I think Chantry House is, is in danger of going back to even money um, if this continues, and, and that, to me, is, is very takeable. Yeah, I agree as well. But I, right, will all be cheering him on for Harriet Graham. She came on, of course, before he ran in the Scottish National. He disappointed there, but didn't he bounce back last time? Right then, shall we have some talking points? Now, we often do hot topics, but feedback we get is people just want to know about what's going to win the races at the moment. But it would be remiss of us, Chris, with you not here to talk about what's been going on. Obviously, okay. since we last saw you... It's been rather, rather a busy time in the news section of the Racing Post, and you've been all over that. We've had the Freddie Tillicky case, of course, the Dun Frost. Um, but something this week came up. Ladies first, of course. Tell us all about this. Mickey's to be Zoll's 2018. 
Yeah, this is one of those stories that goes way back. Uh, poor horse was doped, ladies first. Um, she was given timolol, which is not something I'd come across before. It's a beta blocker. Um, you're not supposed to give it to horses. It's got no veterinary application, but, um, but the idea is that you, you, well, you would think it would slow down a horse's system. Um, it seems to have been used by a couple of guys uh, as a stopping drug. Um, and, uh, you know, the downside of this story is that these, uh, these two guys had every right to be in the stable area at Newcastle on the day in question. They were employed by the race course to do bits of maintenance work um, around the race course stables. Um, and I, I, I believe, you know, some trainers will be very annoyed by this story because it, it seems as though it, trainers certainly to get into race course stables and stable staff to get in the stables during on a race day, they have to go through all sorts of hoops. It's not enough to just have the pass. You've got to show that you, there's a horse in there that hasn't run yet that you've got business to go and spend time with. Um, meanwhile, these two guys are sort of doddering around within the race course stables with three run of the place and, um, and have managed to dope two horses on the day in question. The motivation um, for them doing that was not really gone into at the BHA hearing that I listened into this week. Um, you know, you can only imagine there must be some sort of betting angle. Apparently, there was a wider investigation that went on that they just can't disclose details of. So, I mean, that must be aimed at what it was that's that's got these two guys to do this. Um, Here we are in 2022, thing. and this is in 2018. So first question, I guess, that viewers will have out there, how has it taken so long to come about? Yeah, well, again, that big investigation seems to have been the thing that slowed things down. And, you know, unfortunately, the BHA say, look, we just can't share details of this with you. You'll have to take it on trust that this happened. Um, and there's a BHA barrister saying that, and so you're sort of you're inclined to, to believe him. Um, I think the investigation, as far as the two guys were concerned, that was completed maybe two years ago. And if there hadn't been this sort of following investigation to the betting patterns, we, we imagine it's into betting patterns and, and who's been laying this horse. Um, it, this could all have been processed a long time ago. Meanwhile, Mick Easterby, who trained ladies first um, and was charged because his horse has failed a dope test. And the rules at the time were strict liability. So even if the BHA knows perfectly well that you had nothing to do with it, you're still found in breach um, and there has to be a financial penalty. He's been waiting all this time, like um, three and a half years, to get to the end of this story and find out, you know, what, what sort of punishment he's been facing. Yeah. He had um, a solicitor in this hearing saying very vigorously, you know, you shouldn't be punished at all. This is ridiculous. You she know was six to four well favourite ladies first, wasn't wrong. she? I, I, I remember when this happened. Yeah. And it, I, 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 forgot, I forgot what I've been with it. And you're just thinking, oh, what, something's gone wrong there. Well, maybe, but I mean, you know, favourites do get beaten. They run disappointingly sometimes, and, and maybe a reason emerges, or maybe not. But on this occasion, um, it turns out, you know, that she had the drug in her system. And very sadly, she died a year later. And the connections are left wondering if that experience of wow. having been doped had some contributing factor to that. This is a big story then, isn't it? So, and and these, two, these two guys have got a 10-year ban, um, but the connections of Ladies First are quite rightly asking, you know, why isn't it a lifetime ban? How can you <sighs> contemplate, you know, an end to a ban like that for these guys? Surely there are no circumstances in which we'd ever want them back in the game. One sense is that might not be the end of this because Mick's probably going to... I think not, and there's, there's going to have to be some discussion about um, security and race course stables because, you know, um, very clearly we need more in the way of background checks than, than was used on this occasion. You know, there's a sense of complacency. I mean, it all seems to have gone away a little bit, all this. Yeah, uh, well, I, I don't know if there's complacency, but it, it has taken too long, and we, we don't yet have all the answers to the questions that we have. Um, I mean, you know, how, first of all, how can something like this happen? And it's, you know, it appears that Newcastle has not even been charged by the BHA with any kind of failing, any breach of, you know, the rules that were in place at the time. The, you know, the BHA is not saying you failed to do something you should have done. Um, but the, the sports, you know, integrity is fundamental. You know, we're just not going to have people for, taking an interest in the game, betting on the game if we can't satisfy them that, that the game is completely straight. Um, and therefore, I think we're going to have to do more in the future to, um, to shore up race course stable security. Mm, let's hope the powers that be are listening to Chris there on that front. Uh, something else that came along yesterday, uh, somewhat out of the blue, and again, something that we might have forgotten about a little bit, is changes to the whip rule. Yeah, so we got a notice from the BHA saying, oh, this is going to take a little bit longer than, than maybe we thought. We were expecting a report to be published next month. Um, so it turns out the steering group, um, which had been looking into this matter, um, is, is still talking and still trying to sort of decide exactly what recommendations it wants to make in terms of changes to the, the existing whip rules. Um, it feels like we're always talking about the whip rules. Um, it's been a while, actually, since they were last changed. Um, but no one ever seems to have accepted them as, you know, perfect. 
Um, and I, I don't honestly know if we'll, like, we'll ever get to that situation, but um, evidently there's going to be more changes in the offering. I mean, this, this whole process has been a year in the works, so you would think we're not going to get to the end of the line and have everybody say, actually, the rules are fine as they are. There's going to be change of some kind, and if I know anything, it's going to mean stiffer penalties for the poor jockeys. And who are not over the moon with things at the moment anyway, because we, we have not even really got, got time to go into, of course, um, the, are the weights going back up, saunas and all that sort of thing. Um, lack of communication from BHA, PG, you know, it's it just, it seems like a bit of a mess at the moment out there, doesn't it? Sort of, there's a lot on. I mean, uh, I yeah. think for any race, racing official just now, their entry is piled high. I just wanted to refer you to a friend of the show, Devin Manusier, got involved in this, replying to a tweet from Matt Chapman yesterday who brought this up in the racing Twitter world, as Matt can do. And, and David says, you can see on screen, whip consultation steering group members. 15 people with only two trainers and two jockeys. More than half the members not really relevant to, the, uh, to, uh, to address the issue. Might as well get the local baker and butcher to reshape horse racing. Yeah. <laughs> Strong words, softly spoken. Um, I, I mean, I, I've looked at the list of people who are on the steering group, and I, I think basically that's been a bit of a wild thing for David to say. You know, I personally have no quarrel with the names that are on there. Um, they're a collection of very serious, um, intelligent people, and no doubt all of them, even the ones who aren't, directly linked with racing on a day-to-day -day basis have taken this very seriously. Shall we end on a more positive note here? It was last weekend a rather good win for the horse racing in general, wasn't it, of course? The Clarence House chase, yeah. Shishkin versus Anergamine, a race for the ages. We've been calling for it here at the Racing Post, racing you know, goers themselves, race courses, jockeys, train. Everyone wants to see these clashes as they're now being described. It was great, Chris, wasn't it, first and foremost? Um, it, the race, you could not have hoped for better. If you're going to have two big names facing off, then you want it to be in doubt, you know, more or less all the way to the last sort of 25 yards, um, which is what happened. I mean, you know, the sort of nightmare scenario that some people were envisaging is maybe one of these is going to unseat at the first or something like this. Um, something will go wrong to undermine it as a contest. Um, but it's just so rare, isn't it, to have um, these big names taking each other on away from the major spring festivals or before. Um, and that happened, and it was a terrific race. And the best thing about it is I don't think you can look at those two horses now and say, I know which of those is definitely superior forever, amen. When they get to Cheltenham and take each other on, God willing. Um, there, you know, there's going to be people on both sides um, arguing the toss, and I think a very good case can be made for an argument um, turning it around come March. Well, that's interesting. The, the, the other thing we're hearing is that thankfully both horses have come out of it sound. Yeah. Apparently, I was told that Shishkin from someone in the stable was absolutely bouncing the next day, but you knew he'd had a, a bit of a race. So straight there now, an argument straight there now. So that's great, isn't it? And everyone in horse racing was buzzing. Uh, the, you know, it made the broadsheets, if you like, and. That was the great thing about it. But are we in danger of... Uh, should this be happening every week? It used to happen every week, didn't it? Two grade one horses taking each other on away from a festival. I don't know. I, I don't know if it happened every week. I mean, you've got two unbeaten big-name horses, one from England, one from Ireland. You know, I don't think there's ever been a time in jump racing when that would happen all the time. Um, you, just of its nature, you know, you, you can't really have more than one or two of those a season because um, eventually the horses get beaten. Um, it would be nice to sort of rely on a regular supply of major races where you've got multiple possible winners in contemplation and it's not just a you know a head to head because we had that experience didn't we in the week build up to that Ascot race everybody sort of chewing their fingernails going are these two horses both going to turn up is somebody going to step on a stone at the wrong moment mm -hmm. there's that fragility isn't there with a two horse race if one of them doesn't turn up then it turns into a procession yeah. Um, so, I mean, really what we want, um, you know, it's big races every Saturday where there's loads of horses turning up. And, you know, if somebody's a non-runner, well, that's very unfortunate, but the race is still a race. And that's sort of what I remember from when I was getting into jump racing in the you know, late 80s, early 90s. Yeah. Um, we, we don't seem to have the, quite the depth of talent anymore, um, but we've got to look at, you know, how we can shore up the population of, of classy jump racers. Yeah, no doubt, Henry, that was a race for the ages, a clash of the titans. Uh, according to our handicaps, the best jumps performance, RPR of 181, just slightly edging Tard in the Betfair chase, of course, both away from the festivals so far. To get a 180 at a festival is like the holy grail of handicapping out there. We're probably going to see it again. What did you make of last week? Uh, are we in danger of now becoming complacent, thinking it's all fixed? It's, well, when you can have those days and you look back at the years when we used to have Viking Shadow back after some big sensation, 
And you had three of them going in the champion chase, the Liverpool two and a half miler, and the fact then the, these other big two mile chases. It was fantastic that they met on a regular basis. And wasn't it just such a pleasure to see that Saturday? Yeah, very much so. And of course, first flow last year's winner seemingly ran to form Kim Bailey. Very happy with himself. With the win to million, of course. We could go on and on. But we shall end on a high. Those are your talking points. 3.05 at Cheltenham. The Cleave Hurdle. A division, Pat Cooney, that uh, to the Thiestes Day at Gower on Thursday was blown wide open because the Antipos fab, Classical Dream, fell in a hole. Yes, disappointed. And you do think a Classical Dream as maybe being a bit of a fragile horse. He tends to have gaps between his races. That was disappointing yesterday. Royal Kahala, the horse that won that race, is 7-1. to one. But... Um, Say hello to Champ, the new favourite for the Stayers Hurdle. He's nine to four, non-runner, no bet, and he's two to one on tomorrow. And um, you do look at him tomorrow and think, yeah, he's the most likely winner on all eventualities. Really, he beat Paisley Park well enough last time out. I'm just worried about the pace of the race. There's only five runners. We've a fifty to one chance in the race called Dandy Mag, who made all to win once before in Ireland. Mm. But how quick is he going to go? And will they ignore him anyway? You think Paisley Park, he wants a fast run race. Champ's not bothered. If you're a McFabulous fan, you probably don't want a fast run race because you're not guaranteed to get the trip. Indeed, you were a little bit disappointed on your only crack at it. So how the race is going to be run remains to be seen. So a slow run race certainly brings McFabulous into it and maybe not Paisley Park. So I can see reasons for both of them getting beaten. And I think Champ at two to one on. I think he merits being two on. Very impressive last time out. As I say, say hello to the new favourite. I'm sure it'll shorten up even more if he wins. I think he will do. Wow, OK, all right. So, look, two's on. What do we do with Champ here? Of course, a horse that they thought might be running in the Gold Cup at the start of the season. Uh, we got uh, around about December time. We got wind that maybe mm. uh, the, uh, the plans had changed. This is this is the smallest field since 1998 in the Cleave. Is that right? Okay. Uh, and yet... Just a, it, a bit it, worrying by itself, isn't it? Uh, but it but is still... Um, people will probably hit it with a stick for that reason. Mm. And... With Classical Dream now and blown out, totally rule him off being mad fresh when he turns up at Cheltenham. Hopefully no. he does for the stairs. Seems to be best fresh. I wonder whether we've now got Champ as the anti-post favourite for the stairs. We've got two previous stairs winners in there. This Nagar Oscar, who seems to have fallen yeah. off the edge of a little bit, but very capable on his day. And, of course, Paisley. Has Paisley gone? That's the first question. Uh, I don't know about gone. I mean, he's still sort of run, running well. Um, he hasn't won for a while, has he? Um, well... 13 months would it be since the Ascot race was the last time he won um, uh, he's, he's just he's got no pace has he <laughs> I mean he, um, he, tactical he, angle he's always staying on Darley but do you think they might crack the race on with is far enough um, we're I, looking for a front runner aren't we do well, you think they might well, I don't know it's a really interesting project can, can he even do it if you I want think he, to well that's a good question <laughs> that's a good point um, he just, one, I think he might hate that one horse that Pat rightly alludes to will be suited by a tactical affair, you imagine. If he settles all right, would be McFabulous, who was an eye catcher when he made his return. Uh, yeah, maybe. I mean, he was staying on at the end, but I think that might have had an, a, a bit to do with the fact that the, the winner had won the race and was just not That's doing it. much in front, you know, because mm -hmm. the, the other horse fell at the last and she was left alone, wasn't she? I, I was a little bit disappointed by that. I mean, obviously, he's had the setback to start his season, hadn't he? He, he sort of had the incident in his yard where he's, he's hurt his back. Um, and so maybe you just forgive that and, and say, you know, onwards and upwards. He's always been a really promising horse. Um, you know, he has had wins in the past. Um, I, I just, uh, he's, he's always seems to be short enough in the betting for me, I think possibly because he's always had that reputation. Uh, if you were absolutely forcing me to have a bet in this race, I think I might give another chance to Liz Nagar Oscar. Cheek pieces, not for the first time, but the only time he wore it before um, was some race at Warwick where he, I think he fell at the second. Now, I'm hoping the cheap pieces didn't have the effect of making him fall at the second. I, I don't know of any study that suggests there You'll is a You'll be quickly looking for a new horse to support otherwise. Um, but, I mean, if, if it has the effect of, you know, just focusing him a bit and livening his interest, um, you know, we know perfectly well he's got the ability there. He, he doesn't seem to consent to show it all that often. On his recent form, you wouldn't be giving him any sort of chance. But I think, you know, maybe 25 to 1, Mm. That, yeah, that, that is a big price about a, a you know former champ. Well, it, Pat thinks champs will win, but I think we're both in 
you, none just, of us are about taking, twos on. It's not, not great, taking is it? twos on. Yeah. I mean, even if you do think you'll win, it's I mean, January, this, man. <laughs> this is a horse that's let you down in the past with you know lapses of concentration. Um, it's it's not a race that he absolutely has to win anyway. Yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, it, it wouldn't appeal to me, I must say. No, I, I think we can all agree that we can see Champ lining up as one of J.P. McManus's fancied runners in the Stayers Hurdle. For me, but fabulous. Can't wait to see what he does. 3.20, one of the highlights up on the town moor at Doncaster <coughs> through the jump season is, of course, the Sky Bet Chase. Pat Cooney, Fuzzle Raffles, currently finds him at the head of your market. Yeah, he's been the anti-post favourite ever since we put prices out on this race, Dave, and he is going up to three miles. He was favourite for one of those big races handicaps at Cheltenham over two and a half last time. He finished an honourable fourth, staying on. There was plenty of money for him that day. Um, the step up to three will probably suit him. And he did go down a pound, which I thought was quite kind of the handicapper for what looked on the face of it, a solid enough run. Um, is he better over three miles on good ground? Well, he did win our bet 365, Charlie Hall, albeit in fortuitous circumstances. So probably be better seen to affect over the longer trip. He's seven or two, four to one. That doesn't strike me as a bargain, particularly as favourites have a pretty grim record in this race. <laughs> Others to look at anti-post-wise were Cap the Nord. There seems to be money around for this horse every time he runs. And yeah, beginning to be disappointing, maybe, but um, he's off a mark of 129, and there has been money for him in the 130s before. He's one to consider. The list is endless, really. DBC, he's been an anti post mover, and this is his first run since a wind up. So there's plenty in with a chance. A year ago, you know, I backed Canelo of Alan King in this race, and uh, he finished fourth, and he hasn't done a great deal since, it must be said. But he, 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 is, he is now um, 11 pound lower. He was beaten 13 lengths in this race last year. I, he's one of these horses, Canelo. I just always keep coming back to him. And I might have a few quid in each way on him around about 16 to 1. But Fuse are effort. He's strong at the top of the market. But no bargain for me. He is short, isn't he? Uh, uh, he ticks a lot of boxes, I think. It's just whether there's something lurking in this race. It's a good race, isn't it, of course? Because we've got the yeah. Charlie Hall winner. We've got the Paddy Power winner. We've got the Ladbrokes Trophy winner. And a host of other well-known names as well. Which way you... really competitive, isn't it? Yeah, it is. But before I get to who I think is going to win, uh, Fusil Raffles, Nicky Anderson. We keep talking about Nicky Anderson. He looks like he's going to have a big weekend, doesn't it? Even if one or two of these let him down. And he's even got Janica, who'd be one of the more interesting outsiders in yes. this race. Uh, I happen to look at the um, odds for trainer's title race this week. Uh, There's only bets 365 who seem to be offering it. They're going 7-2, to two, Nicky Anderson. I think that might be a bit big, mightn't I mean, he's, he's got a big enough deficit. I think it might be even be 400 grand. He's got to make up on Paul Nichols at this stage. But, um, you know, he's just, he's got these horses running in, in major races, um, you know, firing in winners all over the place. And you know that come the Cheltenham Festival, he's going to have serious contenders. Meanwhile, Paul has been sort of talking about, you know, Cheltenham's not the be-all and the end-all. You know, we can go straight to entry with some of these horses. What I can't help thinking it, 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 this is basically a coin flip, isn't it, the title race this season? <laughs> um, and 7-2. to two, Fair enough. It may be, it's not everyone's cup of tea, and I, I don't know how big bets, you know, bet 365 want to lay in this market, but... Um, no, something but, tells me after, as soon as we get off this, <laughs> this show, we might be finding out that, that we'll that, give you a chance to get involved in that. Yeah, it does seem a bit big. 400 grand, not... <laughs> It's all right. Yeah, think, yeah. we're mirroring, aren't <laughs> well, we? Now that he's got, he's got horses at the top of the betting for the Supreme and the Champion Chase and the Stairs Hurdle. I mean, yeah. obviously, the, the Irish will just come over and win everything. But, I mean, he, <laughs> you know, he's got chances, hasn't he, in some yeah, big races? Very much so. Um, where did you look for this? Because Kerry Lee's got two here. De Machine, last year, was one of my favourite horses. But it does... He, I think he's, this might not be his day tomorrow. I had a short list. Cloudy Glen was one of them. Labrick's Trophy. Not sure what yeah. happened last time. But if he comes back to that form... We saw a fiddle on the roof. He he's interesting. I think Charlie Deutsch goes up for this ride. Could have stayed at Cheltenham. Um, and I also quite like Cap Course as well. Is that how we, how we pronounce that? Who won the Peter O'Sullivan of mm. course at Newbury? He needs everything to go right for him. And I do remember last year's race. Pat was mentioning Canelo there, Captain Orr. They fiddled the fences. It does take a bit of jumping Donny when they're going at right speed over three miles. And the other one yeah. that was on it was Storm Control. There you go. That's that. That's the one for me, I think. And what's interesting about him, with regard to what you just said about Donny, uh, is he's going to sort of bowl along either right on the front end or you know near the pace anyway. Mm. Uh, and a big field like this, I think that might play quite well. Yeah, the um, young lad on top is highly regarded, isn't he, for ten pound as well? I like him. He's one of these guys, a bit like Kevin Brogan was, who he's had a lot of experience in Ireland without necessarily winning lots of races, yeah. and comes over here and is shown to really good effect. Got quite a decent strike rate actually, and and got Storm Control to win at Newbury the other day. 
Um, he, you know, the horse had been gone through a little bit of a barren spell after he'd had the two wins at Cheltenham, didn't he? And, and he was in everyone's mind. Yeah, 2020, and that was. Isn't it, it went up in the weights, and yeah. now he's come back down again. Even with a five pound penalty for the Newbury win, um, he's still on that rating that he won at Cheltenham in December 2020. Oh, I think you're onto something. So here. I'm, I'm sure he'll run well. Not just the trainer's title, but also. Uh, we are all agreeing on Storm Control as well, who's very well named because at the end of the race, if he's in front, you're going to have to wedge which way he goes. He blows all over the place. Let's hope it's hot. 3.40 at Cheltenham then. Uh, this is the Ballymore, of course, trial. This has been won by At Fisher's Cross in the past who went on to win the Albert Bart. A bit of a max mixed bag since, I think we can say that, but always a classy race. You can see some 160 RPRs in this. And Henry Daly, the horse that's captured everyone's imagination from your stable so far, the gargantuan Hillcrest, who saw off one of Nicky Henderson's, of course, uh, last time at the track. He's a lovely individual, this. He's a little bit unlucky not to be unbeaten, isn't he? Yeah, he was. He was just, when he ran first up the bumper, he was rolling around a bit um, because he was just so big and Richard and Johnson rode him at Johnny and he just took a long time for the penny to drop as he ground his way straight at Johnny. Yeah, you know, of course, beaten by a horse called Wise Guy of Henderson. You've got Balco Coastal to look out for here. I guess the questions are, Henry... We're, we're looking at unseasonably dry ground, aren't we? What would it be like on that? And also the temptation perhaps to run at Doncaster as well, I guess, where the ground would have been the same. Are you are you reluctant to step him up in trip just yet? We've gone for the take of the Cheltenham up to... And, and uh, to be honest, look, it's, it's a sixth race. And if everybody's coming in after the four, four race and same ground, it's a bit quick, which I don't think is going to happen. Um, I, we will obviously think again, but... It, 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 it was really about the ground being just nice to run him on nice ground. He is, as you say, he is a huge horse and he doesn't need running on fast ground. There was that great line, Chris, after he won, of course. Uh, 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 so big I can't measure him. No, that's right. Henry's stick wasn't big enough to, to measure the horse. He's, um, do you have a box big enough for him, Henry? <laughs> Couple is I got a short stick. <laughs> <laughs> now, that's of course what you said to us, but that did trigger everyone's imagination. People do fall, certainly for these colours. The late Trevor Hemmings, yeah. of course, the old-fashioned type, the big monster. He looks the best of the British in certain divisions at the moment, doesn't he? Yeah, and I mean, you would think he's he's just a chaser of the future, isn't he? So it's great that he's doing so well over hurdles, um, and hopefully. Um, the form stands up this weekend. I mean, he's giving weight away to everything, isn't he? It's only a few pounds, but you know, to some unexposed horses, the, there's always a risk there. But um, I think he'll win. I hope he does. Yeah, Nicky, of course, keen on Balco Coastal, isn't he? Of course, unbeaten in two starts. Uh, take out the entry flop, of course. They, horses can yeah, flop in that entry bumper. Early days, you want to be forgiving, I think. Yeah, yeah uh, he, he's the one getting weight that might be interesting. I think the, the market will come for him, but I, I find it hard to tip against Hillcrest as well, I must say. No, I, 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 you know, if you're going to do that, you, you want to be identifying the weakness, and I, I don't see one just now. All right, Henry, unfortunately, it looks like we're all napping Hillcrest. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope he runs. All right, it's going to be sensational, wrong. isn't it? Will we see a real British novice emerge for the festival? Right, weekend winner time. This is the business end of the show, which you all love. And, of course, it would be remiss of me not to give Henry Daly the floor. Now, of course, in the uh, River Don up at uh, Doncaster, where you've not entered Hillcrest, you have got a rather interesting runner there, Henry, in the Trevor Hemmings colours as well. Yeah, it was, I was looking at that, we funnily enough, with the ground in mind, that we I decided to run Bridgman. Because, yeah, despite... The soft ground and the two mile five at Ludlow last time he won. And I think he will greatly appreciate faster ground and three miles. All right, that's interesting. And some comments from Ben Pauling in the week. You need an experienced hand to win that. Of course, big eye catcher the time before. But Henry, if you've got a nap for our viewers out there, that's probably the only reason why they've clicked on this show. <laughs> I am renowned as one of the world's worst bit. But Tinton Abbey and the Mayor's Bumper in the last. Uh, at Cheltenham was very, very impressive at Ludlow. She showed a great deal of speed and if she can stay the trip around Cheltenham on a stiffer track I think she will take all the beating. Brilliant, Henry Day. They love that. Of course, it's an eight race card. They bought the uh, rescheduled bumper for market raising and they yeah. prized money up on this card as well. We should mention that. A nap from Chris Cook, please. Uh, Storm Control, I think. Um, decent price for a horse with a fairly good chance. 
20 to 1 places as I'm looking. I love it. All right, in the sky bet, Chase. I'm going to go in the 2-2-2 at Utoxeter. That's it, the 2.22, bizarrely timed race. But it's a handicap over two mile four, a distance that Wicked West has been crying out for for Dr. Richard Newland. Pat Cooney, over to you to complete the four-timer of naps. Yes, uh, Lingfield for me, the 3.48, number five, small print, trained by Harry and Roger Charlton now. Uh, she improved last time out, won well enough at Kempton. Only went up three pound for the win. I thought the handicapper given, could have given her a few pound more. So she strikes me as progressive, improving, and well handicapped. So I'll be reading the small print in the 348 at Lingfield. All right, it's a cracking weekend, and there's a fine lucky 15 for you out there. Well, Sally, that's all we've got time for on this weekend's What a Shout. What a pleasure it was to have Shropshire trainer Henry Daly with us. We wish him all the best. Some big runners on the weekend. What a pleasure it was to have the front runner back with us oh, as well. Thanks, mate. Can we see a bit more of you in 2022, do you think? Whenever you pick up the phone, I'll be here, Dave. Happy days. It's always fun to chew over weekends. Racing. Not just hot off the press and court cases, but also a trainer's title bet for us as well. Who knew? Well, and the good thing about that is, you know, two or three months from now when the season ends, you'll have forgotten what I said. Unless it wins, in which case I'll remind you. <laughs> Don't worry. We can, we can scroll back on this. Great to have Pat Cooney with us as well. What does the weekend hold for Monsieur Cooney? Yes, I'm in the office, really. As I say, we're Bet365, non run over all races at Cheltenham Festival as from midday on Friday, and I'll be looking at then Nicky Henderson horses as well. You know, they always say you need Saturday horses to win the Trainers' Championship. He's got quite a few this weekend. All right, OK. Chris and Pat will be having their own private conversation, of course, after this show. Great to have you along with us. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to download the free must-have racing post app. You can do that on the App Store or Google Play Store. Don't forget, lots of racing out there. Gamble responsibly, please. All the sport out there from myself, Dave Orson. Enjoy it. <laughs>